Hello, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. I am your host as ever. Well, what do we have for you today? Today, we have books from Oxford University Press. These are uh, relatively new titles. Some are fresh off the press. Uh, some have been out for a few months. Um, might even be a little bit older. But um, I was able to uh, access a few of these as review copies and some of the others I purchased on my own volition. Um, Oxford University Press is amazing. As you know, I really heartily support our university presses and some I love more than others. And I can tell you, Oxford's right up there. Um, so let's just dive in, shall we? Let's see what tickles your fancy. Or as Sean Connery would say, your fancy. All right. Um, Thank you for indulging me. Uh, <laughs> so this is a little book um, that uh, is part of their Great Battle series. So there are several books in this series, but and the series editor is Hugh Strachan, the eminent World War One historian. Um, and I've always been intrigued by this battle, and this is Rotem Kauner. That's the name of the author. Uh, this is Great Battles, Shushima. It's a small little volume here by Oxford. Okay. Uh, do you, have you heard about the Battle of Shushima? You, might, you probably should, if you are a self-respecting history lover, especially global history, military history, uh, things like that. The Battle of Shushima was the most decisive naval engagement in the century that had elapsed since the Battle of Tra Trafalgar in 1805. See, there you have it. Although these two battles are often compared to the Battle of Tsushima, in which the Japanese Imperial Navy defeated the Russian Imperial Navy, was also unprecedented in many ways. It marks the first naval victory of an Asian power over a major European power. The most devastating defeat suffered by the Imperial Russian Navy in its entire history and the only truly decisive engagement between two battleship fleets in modern times. See, and that's why you should know about it. In addition, the Battle of Tsushima was also the most decisive naval engagement of the Russo-Japanese War, and one that exerted a major impact on the course of that war. Its impact was so dramatic, in fact, that the two belligerents concluded a peace agreement within three months of the battle's conclusion. At the same time, and because it involved two of the world's largest fleets, the influence of this battle exerted was both for far-reaching and long-standing. In subsequent years, the symbolic victory of an Eastern power over Tsarist Russia using modern technology was feared and celebrated in both the Western and the colonial worlds. Similarly, and in both Jap Japan and Russia, the Battle of Tsushima had a pro prolonged impact on their respective navies, as well as on their geopolitical ambitions in Asia and beyond. By uh, relying on a diverse array of primary sources, this book examines the battle in depth and is the first to offer a penetrating analysis of its global impact, as well as the way its memory has evolved in both Japan and Russia. Uh, fabulous. It's written by Rotom Counter. So I really wanted to get that one. And uh, I don't have a, I have slim little volumes on the Battle of Tsushima, like the Osprey titles, but this one is a little bit more, you know, it's got more heft to it, so I really wanted to check it out. Um, the next book I picked up here, this is, uh, then we move to Egypt. Very far ranging in my interests. Uh, this is Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World by Bob Breyer. Sorry for the glare. Look at that. Look at that cover. Um... Let's see, this book came out, it might be a fairly recent release. Oh no, this is one of their new ones that, okay. Yeah, this is in a review copy that I was able to get. Uh, these, both of these volumes I just showed you. Well, this came out this year. Well, this one is listed as 2023, but I've got the finished copies. copies so it's probably, uh, it's probably uh, available for order right now. Okay, so what do we have here? Tutankhamun and the tomb that changed the world. It is often thought that the story of Tutankhamun ended when the thousands of dazzling items discovered by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon 
were transported to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and put on display. But there's far more to the Boy King's tale. In this book, we explore the 100 years of research on Tutankhamun that have taken place since the tomb's discovery, from the several objects in the tomb made of me meteoritic or iron that came that came from outer space to new evidence that shows that Tutankhamun may actually have been a warrior who went into battle. Author Bob Breyer also takes readers behind the scenes of the recent CT, CT scans of Tutankhamun's mummy to reveal more secrets of the young pharaoh. Hi, Boomer. <laughs> In addition, the book illustrates the wide-ranging impact Tutankhamun's tomb had on fields beyond Egyptology. Breyer examines how the discovery of the tomb influenced Egyptian politics and contributed to the downfall of colonialism in Egypt. Outside Egypt, the modern blockbuster exhibitions that raised great sums of monies for museums around the world all began with Tutankhamun, as did the idea of documenting every object discovered in place before it was moved. And to a great extent, the modern fascination with ancient Egypt, also known as Egyptomania, was also greatly promoted by the tomb and its resplendent contents. Deeply informed by the latest research and presented in vivid detail, Tutankhamun and the tomb that changed the world is a compelling introduction to the world's greatest archaeological discovery. All right. And there's our author. It's beautiful... Uh, Let's see here, photographs and inserts throughout. Ooh. Tutankhamun's canes. Uh, there's also, I think, some color stuff in here, yeah. So, just what you'd want if you're into Egypt and Egyptian history and Egyptology, like I am. All right, the next, uh, next title we got here, I think this one is brand new as well. Let me get closer to the microphone here. All right. Yeah, this one is listed as 2023 book, so uh, should be available. If I got a finished copy, hopefully you should be able to as well, or at least get it on pre-order. This is a small little book. I'm familiar with the author. This is The Curse of the Summers, The Secret History Behind the U.S. Navy's Most Infamous Mutiny by James P. Delgado, who I believe wrote The China Mirage. Didn't you? Didn't you, sir? Don't... No, wait. James P. Delgado. No! Oh, that was another James. Oh, no. <laughs> I take that back. Um, that's all right. What do we have here? It wasn't Delgado. I think it was Brinkley or something. Who wrote The China Mirage? Okay. The greatest controversy in the history of U.S. Navy... Let me start that over. Let me just take a sip of my tea real quick. A little green tea. The greatest controversy in the history of the U.S. Navy of the early American Republic was the revelation that the son of the Secretary of War had seemingly plotted a bloody mutiny that would have turned the U.S. brig Summers into a pirate ship. The plot discovered he and his co-conspirators were hastily condemned and hanged at sea. The repercussions of those acts brought headlines, scandal, a fistfight at a cabinet meeting, a court-martial, ruined lives, lost reputations, and tales of a haunted ship bound for the devil— and lost tragically at sea with many of its crew. The Summers Affair led to the founding of the U.S. Naval Academy, and it remains the Navy's only acknowledged mutiny in its history. The story also inspired Herman Melville's White Jacket and Billy Bud. Fascinating. Others, connect Others connected to the Summers included Commodore Perry, a relation and defender of the Summers' Captain Mackenzie. James Fenimore Cooper, whose feud with the captain, dating back to the War of 1812, resurfaced in his reportage of the affair. And Raphael Semmes, the summer's late last caption, who later served in the Confederate Navy. He not only let, he was a, he, he helmed the um, Alabama. <laughs> um, CSS Alabama. The Curse of the Summers is a thorough recreation of this classic tale told with the help of recently uncovered evidence written by a maritime historian and archaeologist who helped identify the long lost wreck and subsequently studied its sunken remains, this is a timeless tale of life and death at sea. 
James P. Delgado re-examines the circumstances, drawing from a rich historical record and from the investigation of the ship's sunken remains. What surfaces an all what surfaces is an all too human tale that resonates and chills across the centuries. Yeah, so it's a little volume here. It's 170 pages, but I was not aware of this mutiny. Got inserts and pictures. So, The Curse of the Summers, brand new book from Oxford University Press. Okay, now we're going to move on to some big juicy chunksters. These are brand new. Uh, <laughs> I have two other books by this gentleman, and one of them I will show soon in a book haul. Um, probably this week. Absolutely this week, actually. This is by Lawrence Friedman. And this is called Command. The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. This is his latest magnum opus, Command. All right. This came out. It's listed. Publishers are listing this as a 2020... Uh, yeah, well, it came out this year, just very recently. Um, his, his other two books that I have, I have on my shelf behind me, uh, um, his, big, his big book on strategy, a history, and then the book that I'll be book hauling soon, I have a paperback of it. It's called The Future of War, a History. So this one kind of follows up on that, and it's all about command. Um, it's a big, juicy book. This is our, this is our author. Lawrence Friedman. Effective command is essential to military action and leadership. Giving orders is deeply political, for they must be about achieving the objectives of war and require an assertion of authority. Covering many of the most important conflicts of the post-World War II era, from the Korean War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, to the recent wars in Ukraine and Afghanistan, Lawrence Friedman highlights the political nature of command and shows how military decision-making interacts with civilian priorities. Throughout, Friedman shows how leaders try to shape perceptions of outcomes in both defeat and victory. Pakistani generals attempted to avoid surrender to India even as they lost East, East Pakistan in 1971. Iraq's Saddam Hussein turned his defeats into triumphant narratives of victory. Vladimir Putin's assumption of an easy victory led him to launch a disastrous war against Ukraine. He also covers military figures who rebelled against political leadership, including Douglas MacArthur in Korea and French generals in Algeria, who were so frustrated with their political leadership that they twice tried to change it. Israel's Arik Sharon was consistently insubordinate until he got a chance to run his own campaign in Lebanon. At the other end of the scale, Che Guevara, in 1965, tried to intervene in a civil war in the Congo in a futile effort to make it part of a global insurrection against imperialism. Friedman ends the book with a meditation on the future of command in a world that is becoming increasingly reliant on advanced technologies. Both wide-ranging and authoritative, this will stand as a definitive history of a foundational concept in modern military affairs and politics. So you know... This is something that uh, I have to get my hands on and just, you know, devour. I love how this kind of ranges all over the place, too, you know. Um, he goes everywhere. So, I'm very much in, in mind of doing a Lawrence Friedman trilogy read pretty soon. Hmm? Do strategy, future of war, and command. Oh, that would be fun. So, brand new, out from Oxford. Oh, and then there's this. And then there's this. Ah, a big, juicy biography of a military leader many of you have not heard of. And I have heard of um, rather glancingly in other studies. So, I'm really looking forward to learning more about this man. And who is this man? Let's go to Russia, everybody. This is Kutuzov, A Life in War and Peace by Alexander Mika Barij. Mika Barij, baby, and it is a big chunkster. It is a doorstopper, and you know me. I love big, juicy biographies, especially military biographies. So, who is Kutuzov, you ask? I will tell you. Tolstoy. Tolstoy immortalized him, Stalin lionized him, and yet every Russian recognizes him simply by his patronym. 
He was the general who triumphed over Napoleon's Grand Armée during the Patriotic War of 1812, not merely restoring national pride, but securing national identity. Many Russians consider Field Marshal Mikhail Ilarionovich Golanashev Kutuzov, okay, the greatest figure of the 19th century, ahead of Pushkin, Tchaik. Chay- Tchaikovsky, even Tolstoy himself. Immediately after his death in 1813, Kutuzov's remains were hurried into the pantheon of heroes. Statues of him rose up across the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union. Over the course of decades and centuries, he hardened into legend. As award-winning author Alexander Mikhabarij shows in this fascinating, often startling, and wholly humanizing new biography, Kutuzov's story is far more compelling and complex than the myths that have encased him. An unabashed imperialist who rose in the ranks through his victories over the Turks and the Poles, Kutuzov was also a realist and a skeptic about military power. When the Russians and their allies were routed by the French at Austerlitz, he was openly appalled by the incompetence of leadership and the sheer waste of life. Over his long career, marked equally by victory and defeat, embrace and ostracism, he grew to to despise those whose concept of war had devolved to mindless attack. Here at last is Kutuzov as he he really was, a master and survivor of intrigue, moving in and out of royal favor, committed to the welfare of those under his command, and an innovative strategist. When reluctantly, and at the 11th hour... Tsar Alexander I called upon him to lead the fight against Napoleon's invading army, Kutuzov accomplished what needed to be done, not by a heroic charge, but by a strategic retreat. Across the generations, portraits of Kutuzov have ranged from hagiography to dismissal, with Tolstoy's portrait of him in War and Peace perhaps the most indelible of all. This immersive biography returns a touchstone figure in Russian history to human scale. And here is our, our author, our historian. I'm so excited for this. Oh, this is going to open up just so many different windows of study for me. Wow. And you know what? There's something to be said for conducting a successful strategic retreat. That is one of the hardest maneuvers um, in 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 any type of engagement, is successfully retreating in front of the enemy. It's a hard, hard thing to do. It's way harder than conducting a successful attack or charge. So there's something to be said for that. It takes genius to do that. Um, so look at this, brand new, out by Oxford right now. Get your hands on it. Ask your library to order it. I'm telling you, it's good stuff. All right, what else do we have here? Well, that's not it. This goes with another stack. (laughs) All right. I'm so excited for all these Oxford titles. You don't even know. Um, How y'all doing out there? You enjoying this video so far? You liking something from Oxford right here? I know I am. So this is a new book. Let me tell you. And I don't think I've shown this to you yet. I, I know I haven't. This is, this came out late this year, but it's brand new. You can get your hands on it right now. This is The Invention of Marxism. How an Idea Changed Everything by Christina Marina. It's translated by Elizabeth Janik. All right. It's nice big, It's it's not too thick, but it's, it's well over 400 pages. So, um, oh, this is just good, meaty intellectual stuff. I just love it. Thank you, Oxford. All right, what do we have here? When he died in 1883, Karl Marx left an inte- intellectual legacy of formidable proportions and revolutionary potential, yet one that exerted limited actual political, social, or economic influence. The full force of his ideas did not come into play for another generation and only after they had been appropriated and applied by some of Marxism's earliest proponents. The history of Marxism, in other words, is the story of those who brought his ideas into play. Christina Marina's original and illuminating book focuses on the first generation of Marxists, those who transformed a sweeping but fractious and occasionally abstruse view of historical and social forces into one of the most powerful transnational movements in modern history. The invention of Marxism offers a group portrait featuring such figures as 
Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Victor Adler, Jean Jaurès, Edward Bernstein, Karl Kautsky, and Vladimir Lenin, a diverse and cosmopolitan group who dedicated their lives to interpreting and, more critically, applying Marxist thought. It was through them that his ideas were read, debated, and gradually adopted in socialist movements across Europe and eventually around the world. Marina's book vividly reconstructs the beginnings of Marxism through the individual politicization of those who made it their purpose in life to solve the, quote, social question, unquote, uh, exploring the nexus between theory and practice, ideas and reality. The invention of Marxism shows how what started as a critique of capitalism grew into a fully-fledged political and social movement, one that in the century and a half since Marx's death has profoundly changed the world. Mm -hmm. And not for the better. Just saying. I'm not a fan. But it's important to know these things. And it's important to read about things that, you know, you don't agree with. Um... Who is Christina Marina? She's a professor of modern contemporary history at the University of Bielefeld. Bielefeld. Her research focuses on major themes in 19th and 20th century German and European history, especially World War II, the Holocaust, and bystander history, political and memory cultures in Germany since 1945, the history of Marxism, and the history of historiography. Uh, so a little bit of everything here. This looks really good. So this sounds really good, looks really good. Everything I've looked at it so far looks fabulous. Uh, another another book that's going to open many more windows and doors of for further study. And that's what I love. I love it. All right. Let's see here. This is an interesting book. This came out earlier this year. I wasn't sure how this fit into this uh, channel. <laughs> But it's a history of sorts. Um, so for anyone who's interested, and maybe if you're a numero not a numerologist, but uh, someone who's into statistics and odds, you might like this book. Um, it's an interesting little history. Again, came out earlier this year with the compliments of Oxford University Press. Why, thank you. I got a little bookmark. Um, this is called... For a dollar and a dream, state lotteries in modern America. I could we could have a whole just like a sub thread of people just commenting on you know do you buy lottery tickets or do you not? Are you one of those people that believes in buying a lottery ticket or or likes to? Or are you one of those people that just don't even waste your time or money doing it? And why? Why do you buy it and why do you not buy it? And I, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think it it reveals something about a person. This one question. Do you buy lottery tickets? And, wh and why? It's just interesting. So this is by Jonathan D. Cohen. So let's see what this is about. It's an intriguing little book here. Every week, one in eight Americans place a bet on the dream of a life-changing lottery jackpot. Americans spend more on lottery tickets annually than on video streaming services, concert tickets, books, and movie tickets combined. The story of lotteries in the United States may seem straightforward. Tickets are bought predominantly by poor people driven by the wishful belief that they will overcome infinitesimal odds and secure lives of luxury. The reality is more complicated. For a dollar and a dream shows how, in an era of surging inequality and stagnant upward mobility, millions of Americans turn to the lottery as their only chance at achieving the American dream. Gamblers were not the only ones who bet on betting. As voters revolted against higher taxes in the late 20th century, states saw legalized gambling as a panacea, a way of generating a new source of revenue without cutting public services or raising taxes. Even as evidence emerged that lotteries only provided a small percentage of state revenue, and even as data mounted about their appeal to the poor, states kept passing them and kept adding new games, desperate for their long-shot gamble to pay off. Alongside stories of lottery winners and losers, Jonathan Cohen shows how gamblers have used prayer to help them win a jackpot, how states tried to pay for schools with scratch-off tickets, and how lottery advertising has targeted lower-income and non-white communities. For a dollar and a dream charts the untold history of the nation's lottery system, revealing how players and policymakers alike got hooked on hopes for a gambling windfall. So, you know what? That is really cool. 
I don't think I've ever seen a history about the national, you know, like state lotteries before or the nation's lottery system. I've never seen, a, I'm sure there have been books that have been written on it. I've, they've never crossed my path. So this is interesting. And it's not a, a super large book, but I might dip in. And to answer anyone's uh, questions that you might have in your mind, I am not a person who buys lottery tickets. It's just, that's just me. I feel like it's a waste of money. It's just a waste. But cheers to everyone who um, who disagrees. Okay, final book. This came out earlier, I think, I think in the fall, maybe summer. But it completes um, a trilogy. It completes the trilogy. Um, and I, I wanted to do a big project for this winter. I thought over my Christmas holiday, I'd have this time to really dive into these three books. But we know what happens when you try to make plans. God laughs. Um, so I got real sick. And I'm just getting better. And uh, there's no way I'm going to make it through these. But let me show you the newest book, though. This is the final book in uh, Peter Peter Caddick Adams' trilogy. Outstanding trilogy of which I want to, to delve into. This is Fire and Steel, The End of World War II in the West. Um... The first two books that were sand and sorry fire no snow snow and steel and sand and steel and now we have fire and steel and they're big they're big boys but so Oxford puts out all three I'll show you the other two I uh, I bought one of these with my own funds I think or I think I used a credit for History Book Club actually I think I just bought this but snow and steel is hard to find in hardcover and i like hardcover it was i couldn't find a new copy of it unfortunately without paying a mint so i bought the best used copy i could get of snow and steel so this is a used copy this is the battle of the bulge 1944-45 wait a second are these in order i guess i don't know okay so um that's his and i wanted to start reading that on my vacation but other things intruded. So, but but I have the trilogy now. So I might start to tackle that. So I'm doing Historathon 2023 this year. I, that could be for my fourth quarter when we're covering present day times and, you know, in the block of time. See my Historathon 2023 announcement and then you'll get all the details. Um, and then there was Sand and Steel. This is the one I bought new. These are heavy, thick, beautiful, bodacious books. I love them. Sand and Steel, The D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. Nah. Again, Oxford just makes beautiful. They're all, they all have a similar look and feel, which I love. And then you have this most recent book, Fire and Steel. The world, end of World War II in the West. So, um, yeah, Fire and Steel is the concluding volume of his epic trilogy covering the last year of the war in the West. Peter Caddick Adams brings the final chapter of the fight against Nazi Germany vividly to life. He explores the daunting challenges the Allies faced crossing the Rhine along a 300-mile front. Um, he recounts individual acts of resolve and heroism, of exhausted troops pressing forward against unforgiving resistance. He describes their first encounters with the bar barbarity of Hitler's regime as they reach the gates of Buchenwald, Belsen, and Dachau. He illuminates the strategic decisions made at Allied headquarters and offers pin sharp portraits of those who made them. So again, my trilogy is complete. Outstanding. Thank you, Oxford, for these wonderful works of history. Um, I need to find some good space on my shelving, maybe in here, might go in the uh, living room, might go in the parlor. I have many library locations in this home. So those are some fantastic new releases from Oxford University Press. Let me know what appeals to you. Um, let me know which one you think I should start diving into first. Like I said, I'm, uh, I'm starting to come back from all the, the sickness and not being well and not having even energy to read. Um, and now I've got so many things to read. So if you can help me pick out from the stack what to dive into first, that would be really helpful. I want to dive into all of it. But with that, BookTube, I will leave it for there. I will leave it there, and I will be back soon with more books, more book talk, more book reviews. 
um, and some more channel announcements. So stay tuned. Take care. Bye.